Cross and Crown Baptist Church. It's great to have you. We've got a very special day here today. We've got missionary Sarah Glover with us here and uh, super excited about what the work she's been doing in Papua New Guinea. And uh, we'll be show she'll be showing her video here in a few minutes here. And uh, we're just excited to be here worshiping with her today and uh, with you as well. If this is the first time, we want to say thank you for coming out here. And for those who have tuned in online with us as well, thanks for joining with us. And uh, may God bless his word today. May he bless the worship here this morning. So let's get started. Let's turn over in our hymn books to hymn number 545. Hymn number 545, bring them in. Once you find that, go ahead and stand with me. Let's sing it out here this morning. On that first verse. Hark, tis the shepherd's voice I hear Out in the desert dark and drear seated this morning. Again, we want to welcome you here to church. As this is the first time that you have been here, we want to make sure that you get a welcome packet in your hand. If there's anyone who didn't get one, would you just slip your hand up real quick in here? It's just a little bit of information about our church, as well as a connection card here. This is just for you to fill out as much as you feel comfortable filling out. That way we have record of your visit. Remember, uh, church members, this is also for you. If you need to uh, connect with Pastor or myself about something, there's a little slot right on the back there. You can drop a prayer request to us or something that you need to mention to us in case you're not able to grab us at the end of the service. So make sure you grab one of those. All right, looks like everyone has one. I want to just go over a couple things in the bulletin here. Uh, we had made an uh, announcement last week about the teen service. The teen service being on June 10th. We actually moved that back or forward one week, however you want to think about the calendar. We moved it to the 17th, okay? So that's seven, the June 17th, Sunday p.m. now instead of June 10th, all right? That's in there. As well as in there, you can look at all the... Um, uh, we've got a deacons meeting, I believe, scheduled for tonight, as well as June 19th. Ladies, there's a ladies outing, and Miss Kim said there will be some uh, details coming up about that. Uh, we have a special day here today. It is uh, Pastor and Miss Kim's anniversary today. And uh, Pastor, how many, how many years? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He didn't answer the how many years question yet, but... Uh, 29. 29, there you go. So make sure you give him a, a happy anniversary as well. It's not just their anniversary today. He planned it very well so he could always remember his anniversary. They got married a day before his birthday, and so he found a nice, easy way to remember. So tomorrow is his birthday, and I think it's only fitting that we sing happy birthday to him this morning, all right? And I won't ask him how old he is because he's still a spring chicken. So uh, we'll just... We'll... I was married when I was six. That's right. We may need to talk about this later, but uh, 
figure something out here. Anyways, but we don't have the music, so as uh, someone once said, we'll just have to sing happy birthday acapoco, okay? So we'll sing it out here this morning. Happy birthday to Pastor. Let's do it together. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Pastor. Happy birthday to you. Come pray for us, Oh, I gotta pray now. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Um, some people go through life uh, miserable, and uh, some people go through life with no friends, and they have a really, really hard time. I have to say, God has blessed me so abundantly. Thank the Lord for all of my dear friends. Thank the Lord for my church. Thankful for uh, each of you. And praise the Lord and for my wonderful wife of 29 years. And she gets a lot of credit. Amen? So <laughs> praise the Lord for that. All right. Let's, let's uh, try to pray now. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your great mercy and your grace and your long suffering. Yes. Lord, we thank you that we can unite our hearts together as one today to worship you, Lord. From such a diverse world and all around this country and different nationalities and cultures and backgrounds, we have so many differences among us, Lord, but we're here today as one because of the work of Jesus Christ, because of the, the unity of the Holy Spirit and the love that we share. Father, we thank you for helping us to be the bride of Christ. And Father, we pray that we would be that bride without spot or wrinkle, that you would help us to strive to be pure and holy and to be in love with you, Lord. And I pray that you bless this service. I thank you that we have one of your faithful servants here today. And Lord, we pray that you bless Sarah as she ministers to our children today and as she uh, shares an updated video uh, of her ministry in the jungle. And we, we pray that you would help us all to be sacrificial like she has been. We thank you for all that you're doing. We pray that you bless this service in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.
Turn in your hymn books to hymn number 534, if you would. Hymn number 534, Send the Light. Let's sing that first verse in that chorus. Let's stand together. Then we'll take some time and welcome everyone to the service this morning. Hymn number 534. There's the calls come ringing o'er the restless waves. Send the light. Send the light. the service. school class and our teens were in there we had a fantastic update of our missionary that we've been working with uh, to take the gospel to Papua New Guinea to the jungles and when some people think about missions that's the first thing they think of however a great number of missionaries and missions works are actually taking place in cities across the world uh, but if the Lord should call you to deepest darkest jungles uh, or to the inner cities Wherever he calls you, may it be the, pr the, the prayer of your heart and the willingness to say, I will go. Here am I. Send me. Sarah was such a, a, a lady who was busy serving the Lord faithfully at her local church in Michigan for years. <laughs> her, the, the housewife of the church. That if anything needed to be done, she was on it. She was doing it. She was taking care of it. You know, every single church needs people like that. Amen. Just serving the Lord 100%. Hey, you need the steeple painted? You need the sidewalk swept? You need the toilets cleaned? You need this done? You need that, that done? You need the paperwork, phone call, secretarial, all kinds of things. Because there are a lot of business aspects of a church that need to be taken care of. And uh, Sarah was doing all of that, and yet she said, Lord, I want more. 
and God was wonderful to answer her prayer and called her into an amazing ministry that is so diverse. She translates in a number of ways. She has the original Greek and Hebrew of the Bible, translating that into uh, the Kamea language. The Kamea language is an unwritten language. So before she could put the Bible in that language, she had to write a language for them. And uh, doing all of that work as well as teaching other languages and teaching the people and Bible stories and children's ministries and helping in the clinic, in the medical clinic. And there's so much going on. We would love for Sarah to just go ahead and take a minute here and show us by video about what's going on. Is there anything you'd like to, to say, an introduction? Yes, and stop by her table in the back. She's got a lot of interesting things there. Some of the work that they have been working on for the languages and the translations, and they have 30% um, of the New Testament done, and we praise the Lord for the work and the progress that's there. Okay, so if we'll go ahead and dim the lights, we may even need to, to uh, close the shades a little bit here. My name is Sarah Glover, and for the last eight years, I've had the awesome privilege of having a front row seat to the work that God is doing in Papua New Guinea. And so many of you have given and have prayed and invested in my ministry, and I'm so grateful to each of you. So for the next few minutes, I would just like to give you a little glimpse into some of the work that God is doing in Papua New Guinea and some of the ways that he has allowed me to be involved in his work. And my prayer is, is as you watch, that your eyes will affect your heart and that your heart will just respond in praise to God alone. And so much of the work that I do here in the ministry I'm involved in is to aid our Bible translation project. I wanted to give you all a first-hand update of the Bible translation project, and we're going to let the translation team do that for us. We're the uh, Kamea translation team, and uh, I'm John, and this is Ben and Yali, and we're working on the Kamea New Testament along with a couple of other projects in the uh, trade language of Talk Pigeon, including a, bi a study Bible. Um, Yali's work is to read the Kamea Bible as it's been translated by Ben, and then he translates it back into Pidgin, and then we study, we check that to see if it's, if the meaning is clear. Ben takes the translation that I do in Pidgin and turns it into Kamea. And so that's the process, is I do it, then Ben does it, then Yali does it, then we all three compare them together. And to this point, um, we have completed... Um, First, second, and third John. We have finished James, Galatians, Philemon, Acts. Uh, we've done a rough draft of Luke. We finished Mark, and we're currently uh, working on Matthew. And uh, we've actually Ben is doing some recording right now. Um, and so these are the scripts, which are in Kamea, and that's also a very good check when he reads it as if it was a book instead of reading it one verse at a time. 
and then we produced um, a study Bible work in Pigeon in Proverbs, um, the first ten chapters, with notes and references, which is a new thing. It's never been done as far as we know. And then we're getting ready to complete booklet size um, comparisons in three languages, English, Pigeon, and Kamea. And so that's the update. Sarah is the one who does the laborious, time-taking work of typing all of the front translation in, and then all we have to do is edit it. And uh, we're very thankful for what Sarah does for us. Mm. And she's also teaching our people how to read so that they can read the work that the team's producing. Mm. So big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. Again, I want to thank you for your investment in this ministry. And I just simply ask for your continued faithful prayers for me as I seek to follow the Lord and do his will. Here 
and use a little English, not just pidgin or Khmer. So, all right, great. We'll let you go on out now. Thank you, and uh, what a privilege it is. Okay, when we have our offering this morning, the men are going to come in just a moment, and if you would like to give a special love gift to Sarah, uh, the only way we'll know about that is if you put that on the envelope. So if you will grab an envelope, if you have an offering prepared. If you didn't, she will be here tonight as well. If the Lord puts that on your heart, you can also give it that time in the evening service. Now you wanna come back because this is where I think missionaries really connect with churches is in the evening service. We hear about them, we, we hear from them, we see their video and so forth, but it's when you do that one-on-one -on -one interaction that you can really starting to get the, the heart of the missionary and uh, find out a lot more on a personal level. Okay, so come back to the evening service tonight for that. And again, for the offering, if you'd like to do so, just write that make uh, in the special love, just mark for Sarah, and we'll get that to her to help her with all the extra additional expenses she has of traveling the country. She said she's done, what was it, um, 9,000 miles so far? Uh, since she has been back uh, just driving around the country and so that's a lot of a lot of uh, uh, travel and, and just wear and tear on the body and so pray for her and uh, she'll probably want to get back to <laughs> the the, uh, the village there just to rest but you can tell she's not resting she's busy doing the work of the Lord we're proud of her we thank the Lord she's one of our missionaries okay let's go ahead and receive the offering as we give to the Lord let's prayerfully Praise God for how he's provided for our needs and how we can give back. Brother Kevin. I'm going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to your house and worship this morning, Lord, with our hearts and eyes open to your word, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for everyone that's here and for everyone that's listening at home. We wish they could be here, Father. But I pray, Lord, that we can uh, do you justice today, Lord, uh, by our attentiveness and our willingness to learn more from you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you please uh, anoint the pastor's lips to what he has to preach for us today, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you help us to remember and uh, to help us grow each and every day, learning from you, Lord. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you please be with those that uh, are struggling right now with their faith who don't really know what to believe or where to turn to, Lord. But uh, I pray, Lord, that you please put somebody in their life that they could uh, and truly know what it is to be a child of God. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for today. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this offering. I pray, Lord, you please use this offering uh, for your glory. I pray, Lord, for the missions that uh, the missionaries that you have placed before us, Lord. I pray, Lord, you please with Sarah and, and uh, her uh, uh, selfless sacrifice that she's made to uh, do this from her own heart, Lord. Uh, the will of you, Lord. I pray, Lord, you please help use this offering. Please bless it and uh, help us, Lord, to give out of not out of obligation. But I love you and hope for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
second. Let me just remind you that if you didn't have a chance, if you wanted to participate in giving towards uh, Sarah Glover and you weren't able to do that because you didn't have your checkbook or cash or whatever, you can just pull out your phone and do it right on the uh, church website. We do have the online giving option there as well. And uh, it's very simple. It's got the ability for you to give right to special love offering. And then you can just, in the memo section, just type her name and uh, whatever you want to give towards that. We'll make sure we get that to her. We don't want you to miss being able to be a blessing to her. And so I just want to let you know about that as well. Guys, come on up here. Let's take our Bibles this morning, and if you would, we're going to continue in our series on the life of King David and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9 today. Let me back up a little bit here and remind us of what happened a few messages back. And David was running from Saul. And as he was hiding out in the wilderness, he knew that Saul wanted to kill him. And so Saul's son, Jonathan, who was heir to the throne, came to him in the wilderness and said, David... I know God has shown me you are God's choice to be the next king, and I'm not going to be the next king. I know it. And, and I know that my time will come when the, God's plan for me is to be eliminated and off the scene. And, and, and when that happens, David, I'm asking you to show my family kindness. Now the years have passed. In the second Samuel chapter 9... We find, if you'll turn there, I, I need to turn there as well. In 2 Samuel 9, we find something happening here. In verse 1, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, what has transpired in over all of these years, that there was a great battle, and the Philistines came and were victorious over Saul, 
Saul died, Jonathan died, many Israelites died, <clears throat> Israel was defeated. And David, he couldn't just make himself king, he was out hiding. And, and so after that, the tribe of Judah made him king of the south, that was Judah. But all the rest of Israel, they said, no, we don't want you. And so Saul's general took Saul's other son and made him to be king, and that's the way it was for seven more years. You know, the promise that God said to David, you're going to be the king, and man, David, when is this ever going to happen? When am I going to be the king? He had to wait seven more years. All this long, drawn-out time that's involved here, finally, when David descends to the throne as king over all of Israel, all 12 tribes united with one heart, have said unanimously, David, we understand now you're the king. And one of the first things he says is this. Is there anybody left in Saul's house that I might show kindness to? The Lord laid on my heart this week to preach a message to you about kindness. Now, when you think of kindness, you think of, oh, that's a very kind person. He held the door for me. Not a lot of kindness going on these days, is there? You drive down the road, and there's a great absence of kindness, right? But there's, you know, you can understand kindness in that way is a little bit, you know, can be interpreted a lot of different ways, right? I mean, I, I grew up in a country where if you saw another car on the road, you just had to speed up and pass it just because you're not used to seeing anybody in front of you ever. And, and so kindness is, you know, always... You're letting someone take the, this way, and you go this way, and I'll be nice to you and kind to you. And then, and then my friend invited me, let's go to Chicago where I grew up. And you're driving. And I was young, and I didn't have any experience driving in a city like that. And, and we went downtown. And I'm driving along, and I'm like, I need to get in the next lane. And so I put my blinker on, and all these cars are going, and nobody's letting me in. And I'm wondering, is there not one kind person in this city? What's going on here? And they taught me how to drive, and they said, if you have one-third of a car length, that's yours. And I said, what do you mean? He says, if, they, if someone gives you one-third of a car length, stick your nose in there where they have to hit their brakes. And I thought, well, that's not kind. That's just hard for me to do. And he said, try it. So I did, and they did not get angry at me. They did not blow their horn. They weren't upset. They didn't give me any cursing or gestures. That was how you drive there. That was normal life. And see, we all come from different backgrounds to what I perceive someone as not being kind. They, they're, they're not even phased by it. And when I think I have to do this or I have to do that to show kindness, they're like, what in the world are you doing? That's unnecessary. We, we come from different backgrounds, and that's why we get so offended all the time. Right? You weren't kind to me. What? Well, what's the problem? So we got to understand that we all have different ideas of what kindness is. But friend, there's always one authority in our lives, and what is that? The Bible, amen? Well, I want to hear a hearty amen on that. The Bible, amen, right? The authority that brings a level playing field to every single one of us where I might have to come up to the standard, you might have to come over to the standard or from another direction, but we're all going to arrive at this one standard in every area of life. And when it comes to this idea of kindness, I think we need to have the Bible teach us some things. That's what I want to share with you today. Look with me in chapter 9 of 2 Samuel. It says, David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. Now, what happened is that when there was this chaos that was taking place about the sons of Saul being killed, and there was a threat and an invasion, there was a nursemaid who snatched up this little baby. And as the panic ensued throughout the palace there, 
this little baby named Mephibosheth was carried by the nurse and she was running and somehow she fell, somehow she tripped. We don't have all the details, but she dropped the baby. And the baby survived, but perhaps his spine was so damaged that he became, quadru- uh, became paraplegic and he could not walk. For the rest of his life, as he grew up and as he became a man, he was needing the care of someone else. David didn't even know this. David said, I want to be kind to someone from the house of Saul. Why? Because many years ago when I was out in the field, Jonathan said to me, will you be kind to my house when I'm gone? And so as David assumed the throne and, and, and rose to that level of authority, he said, the first thing I want to do is I want to fulfill my word. I want to be a man of my word and my pledge and my honor was to be kind to Saul's house. So is there anyone left? And this is Mephibosheth. Where is he living? Where is he? Verse 3, and the king said, is there any of the house of Saul? And he said, Ziba said unto him, Jonathan hath yet a son. He's lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Meal, in Lo Debar. It's interesting to study our Bibles and figure out different things. That these strange words mean things. First of all, he's, he's in Lodabar. He was a fugitive, hiding, fearful, outside the realm of David. In an area that was called Lodabar, that means of no pasture. Here he is, who was once an heir to the throne himself, Jonathan's son, And now he's hiding out where you can't even keep a small flock of sheep because there's no grass for them. He's living out in the desert. Then King David sent and fetched him out of his house of Machir, the the son of Emil from Lodabar. And now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? And David had a new man in his house. He goes on to tell Ziba, he says, Ziba, you can still be in charge of all the assets and properties of the deceased King Saul. You can run his farm, you can till the land, you can take care of the flocks, and you can manage all of the household and the funds. But Mephibosheth, he's going to eat at my table every meal of the day. I want him in my house. And Mephibosheth conceded and moved in with King David. What a beautiful story. And we see this here two times he refers to this word kindness. Have you ever dwelt on that? What is kindness? We think about maybe it's the words we speak or the actions we do. Do you know of all the character traits that you could possess, there's only one that you cannot express without doing something, and that's kindness. I can have love and I can pray for people and I can care for people and I can do, but love, you can have love and not do anything. I mean, you could be apart and, I, I, hey, I can't help that person. They're, they're 500 miles from here. I can't do anything, but I can pray for them and I can love them, right? But if you have kindness, kindness is the character trait that is non-existent until it is an action. What is the Bible going to teach us about kindness? Bear with me just a few moments here. I want to show you some things. The Bible says, take your Bibles and turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, Galatians, Ephesians, then we'll turn to Philippians, Colossians. Ephesians chapter 4, here's a verse that you need to highlight, underline, memorize, hide in your heart, and use it every single day of your life. To get the context, let's start with verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieve not. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. 
So, verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's a verse you ought to memorize. Because you'll find that in every problem of your life, there's an absence of forgiveness. And if you can just learn to forgive, you'll find freedom, you'll find a release, you'll find God's grace flowing in your life. But how does forgiveness happen? It's something that occurs in your heart but is carried out with your hands, and that's called kindness. Kindness. Now, what are we talking about kindness? I want you to understand this as we're laying the foundation of Bible kindness is always tied to this concept of forgiveness. Letting a sin be forgiven. An offense that someone has done to you, letting it go and turning it over to God. Then kindness is always tied to that. Turn over to Colossians chapter 3. A few pages over. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 3. Verse 12. Now tell me if I'm, I'm right here. Is it always tied to this idea of forgiveness? In chapter 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore, because you, didn't, you weren't born with it. It doesn't come naturally. When you wake up in the morning, you don't have it. And so you need to put this on every day. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, these things, vows of mercies, kindness, Humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering, forbearing one another, and what? Forgiving. This is how life operates. You're going to need to engage in forgiving someone all the time. That is the way. And then with that, there's always this concept of kindness. Now, this is a character trait. You hear about random acts of kindness and and doing nice things for people. I call it the Pollyanna Christianity. It's just going to be full of happy and joy and nice and all of that. But let me tell you, kindness goes far deeper than that. This last week, I was at the bank taking care of some business for the church, and uh, <clears throat> I was over hearing some of the conversation going on and, and uh, talking with the, the uh, manager that was there. And she said, this man came in, and he went to do something at the ATM, and when the thing opened up with the uh, $20 that he had wanted to get out, there was $200 in cash already in there. So he had $220. And he came around, you know, if, what, what would you do if that was you? It's like, hallelujah, <laughs> praise the Lord. Now, he came around, and when the bank opened the next day, he came inside, and this lady said for four times he came in to the bank. And finally, on the fourth time, he said, I cannot keep this money, and if you keep putting it back in my hands, I'm walking out. And he laid it on the counter and walked out. That's not my money, he kept saying. He had a clear conscience. Isn't that great? That's wonderful. You know, what would you do? You know what I would do? I would be kind to somebody. I have 220. Here's 20. Here's 20. Here's 20. And I'm only going to keep 100 for myself. You know, would, would you do that? There's all kinds of ways you can be kind. <clears throat> Kindness is this idea of forgiveness and sacrifice of self. It's easy to do when you have nice people. You know, here they are. They're walking up the street, and they've got their arm lo loaded down with bags and boxes, and you're like, oh, right there, let me get the door for you. Come this way. That's a kind act, is it not? Here, let me help you carry that. That's a kind act. But kindness biblically goes far deeper than just those things. It's something different. God's kindness, we will see, is deeper. Now, it's part of His character. Turn back to Joel in the Old Testament, at the end of the Old Testament, Joel chapter 2. Real Bible kindness is a character trait of God Himself.
In Joel chapter 2, we have this beautiful call for repentance from sin. In verse 12, Therefore now also saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. God is not looking for someone just to say, Yeah, God, I'm sorry. No, he's wanting it to happen in the heart. And when, when repentance happens in the heart, it's the heart gets squeezed, and I call it, it squirts out through the eyeballs. Repentance. You don't have to cry, but the spirit of the heart is broken. And he says, turn with all your heart with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend or tear that heart and not your garments. Don't fake it on the outside. Turn unto the Lord your God. For God is what? Gracious. Say these words together with me. He's gracious, merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Now, if you take the word kindness out, think about it. Is God gracious? Amen? Is God merciful? Yes. Amen. Is he slow to anger? Amen. We are all thankful for that. It, does God repent him of the evil? That means, did God change his course of action against us? You see, when I did wrong and I disobeyed and I was in sin, God says, judgment's coming, buddy. And here comes judgment like a semi full speed ahead, barreling on down toward me. And then I all of a sudden say, Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. And I mean it with all my heart. And, and God goes, and backs up. And you're like, by the skin of my teeth, I almost got flattened. God's judgment was on the way. It was rolling down. God repents him of the evil. That means he reversed his course of action. So, what have we got? God's gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He reverses his action. But folks, what word did I leave out of the character traits of God? What was it? Kindness. Now, God's kind. And let's look at those verse again, the verse 13. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's He's of great kindness and repents him of the evil. You know, here's what kindness is. What would cause God to stop the freight liner of destruction and judgment coming towards you? Was it because you stopped it? Hold on now, God. I'm asking for forgiveness. It's all me that stopped the judgment to come. Is that it? What stopped the judgment of God in our lives? His kindness. And what is kindness? It's more than just saying, oh, here you go. I'm doing something kind. I'm mowing your grass for you. I'm doing all these nice things. No. Kindness was the sacrifice of God himself. The only thing that stopped the semi of hell and destruction and judgment on our sin was not the fact that we apologized and were sorry, although that's something we need to do. What stopped the judgment of God was His own kindness. That's who God is. He was willing to take you and step you out of the way and get flattened Himself. That's Bible kindness. Kindness is self-sacrifice. Now, David, why would he do that? Because God was working in his heart. Did you realize that the word kindness is also translated a different way in the New Testament? We get to Galatians chapter 5, and the fruit of the Spirit is what? Say them together with me. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Now, let's stop at gentleness. Gentleness is the word kindness. That doesn't mean that I'm a very genteel person. I know how to be civilized. I know how to place the fish fork here and the spoon here and the dessert knife there. I mean, that's gentility or being a gentleman and holding the door. It, it's more than that. Gentleness is a spirit of God produced character trait of God that we aren't born with. We're selfish people, right? You know, it's only because I get my hand slapped that I don't grab someone else's, you know, cinnamon cake, <laughs> cinnamon bun. 
Oh, so I've learned to control myself. But if I had my own way, and some kids are still this way, and they're in the school of learning to, to learn to control themselves, they're reaching grab someone else's toy or someone else's food, right? I want it. <laughs> and that's the way we would all be, right? But we've learned some civility. God's gentleness goes way beyond that. It means he's self-sacrificial. And that's our character trait of our God. Did you realize that the psalmist David knew so much about this, this character trait that God produces that in Psalm 18, 35, he called out to God and he said, Thy gentleness hath made me great. You know, you're not a really great person because of something you achieve or do. You're a great person if God makes you great. And God makes you great through this pipeline or funnel of His character flowing down through to you. And in Galatians 5, we saw that was a fruit of the Spirit. It's not produced on our own. It doesn't come from us. God produces that spirit, that gentleness, that kindness of self-sacrifice to other people as we yield to Him. And as we yield our lives and surrender to the Lord, God opens up the windows of heaven and His character flows down through us. And when we have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, all of the fruit of the Spirit flowing through us, we become great. What makes you a great person? It's not how much you can score in basketball or uh, how many different things you can achieve. You know what makes you great? It's the Spirit of God controlling you. David said, Thy gentleness hath made me great. But so God is working on David's life. Now let's go back to our story with 2 Samuel. And keep your finger there if you haven't turned. And then also turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 2 Samuel chapter 9. Interesting phrase that he uses here. Look at verse 1. Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for whose sake? Jonathan's. Because of that contract, his word that he gave Jonathan. But also in verse 3, and the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? Notice that. Not just Mike being kind, but the kindness of God unto him. And this is for Jonathan. This is for Jonathan's sake. Look at verse 7. David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for whose sake? For Jonathan thy father's sake. Now, let me ask you this. Did David show Mephibosheth kindness because he liked Mephibosheth? Did he, was he kind to Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, because he enjoyed his company or he liked him? He got along with him? Folks, he didn't even know who he was. He didn't even know Mephibosheth. But yet he committed himself to this person that, you mean, oh, tell me more about him. Oh, he's lame in his feet? Well, it doesn't matter. Bring him on in. I'm going to love, love on him anyway. He could eat at my table every single meal. I'm going to take care of him. Why? Because he committed to Jonathan and all of Jonathan's descendants. This is not pity. This is promise. And biblical kindness ought to be the mainstay character trait that flows through every single one of us. Because with it, God is preparing the hearts of people that they might find the kindness of God. My heart was moved in our Sunday school hour this morning as Sarah told a story about the national called Susan. There was reference to it in the video where you saw the picture of Sarah lying on the stretcher there and giving blood in a blood transfusion for Susan to be able to live. She had tuberculosis and was going to die otherwise. 
Susan had not yet received the Lord Jesus as her Savior. And Sarah was so burdened for her that she needed to trust Christ, and she said, I'll do whatever it takes. And finally, on that one last day, when nobody was willing to, do, to give their own blood to find if there was a match, Sarah said, check my blood and see if it matches. And it matched, and so she there that day immediately gave her blood, and it was infused into Susan's bloodstream, and Susan survived, and Susan lived. Two months later, Susan received Jesus Christ as her Savior and is now in heaven. And, and Sarah told me in between services, she said, and she said at the end of the Sunday school hour, she said, we're going to see our sister Susan in heaven. And she said, I don't want any credit. I don't want any praise. I don't want any glory for what I, I was just doing what I had to do. And when I saw that event and I heard that story, I said, that is exactly what God put on my heart to preach. Because, folks, that's kindness. Now, I am all a, a, a major proponent about evangelism, getting people saved, amen? We have got to shine the light, and we've got to get out there and carry the gospel. And these people who are all around us are lost and, and dying and going to hell. They need the gospel. But I have been around people who thought that their job was just to annoy you to death with the gospel. I was driving home from visitation one day where I had visited a bunch of Sunday school children for our bus route. And uh, I was trying to win them to the Lord and through our junior church and through our bus ministry and the moms and the dads, if you can ever find them, and, and try to work with them. And I was on my way home. I came to this intersection there in Pensacola, Florida, and there was a man standing out there with his family, and there was a big sign, and it said, you're going to burn in hell. And he had a loudspeaker who was standing on the grass median at the stoplight, and he screamed. And I happened to be the very, very first car there, and I pulled up to the stoplight, and uh, I was smiling at him and, and uh, just looking at him, and he just, You're going to hell right now, thus saith the Lord. And I rolled down the window and said, Not me, buddy. I'm on the way to heaven. I highly doubt that. You know, just, really? Now, then there's the other extreme. It's called friendship evangelism. Well, just be nice to your neighbor. Be kind to your neighbor. Don't throw rocks at his dog. You know, just do nice things. And, and, and you'll win them eventually. One day, in some mysterious blue moon, they're going to come over and they're going to be like, tell me about your God. Why? You see, neither one of those is right. The truth is, God wants us to have His character in us as we go through life. And that's why it's so critical and crucial that every day, every, every day of the week, Monday through Saturday, and not just on Sunday, every day of the week, we live the Spirit of Christ, which includes kindness. And kindness is self-sacrifice where I give my word and my promise, and I hold true to that, and I am going to sacrifice myself and be the doormat that people walk on. That still goes against our character, doesn't it? That's not, that's not what I want to do. I want to defend myself. Now, there is a place for self-defense, right? But boy, we like to pull that one out all the time, a little bit more than we need to. When most of the time, God is working in the heart of someone, and we are expected by the Lord to have the Spirit of Christ but when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself unto him that judges righteously. Right? And kindness says, it may cost me. I don't need to do this at all, but I'm going to. And I don't even know who Mephibosheth is, but I'm going to be kind to him because I said I would. Any child of yours, Jonathan, I'll take care of. That's kindness. You know, this kindness spirit is, in, in, picture with me, two people with me. Here's, here's this person over here that is really, really walking with the Lord, and this person over here is not. And we're not going to ask anybody to come up because then you'll be wondering, like, why did he choose him to be the one not walking with the Lord? <laughs> you know? Kevin, you would be over here. Okay. <laughs> 
And so let's just imagine there's two people. And if I'm walking with this person and I'm getting fed by them spiritually and they're iron sharpening iron and I'm walking in in such a way that I'm challenged spiritually and, and, and you know what? I'm going to be more like them and I'm going to maintain more of that spirit of Christ. But if I'm over here with this person that is not walking with the Lord and I'm spending my time with them, what am I going to do? I'm going to start acting like them. I want to show you something in 1 Corinthians. Take your Bible, turn to 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And I've written down the wrong reference. It's not there. Let me quote it for you. Because it's so easy to, to memorize. The word gentleness is our word kindness. And it's also translated one third way. See if you can tell what it is. The Bible says evil communications, that means spending time with, corrupts. What's the next two words? Evil communications corrupt good manners. Do you know what good manners is? There's our word, kindness, or gentleness. Spending time with someone who is not following the Lord is going to do what? It's going to make that bubble level of of where you are filled with kindness to begin to drain out of you. And as you move toward those who are walking with the Lord, it begins to rise back up. As we spend time away from those who are walking with the Lord, we spend our time with those who are not, and they are not focused on the Lord, their hearts are away from God, whether they're saved or not, those are the ones who drain out of us the spirit of kindness. And that just doesn't apply spiritually, but you think about that, like the inner city where people, all kinds of, you get a whole bunch of wicked people all piled up together, and what are they going to do? They're going to rub off on each other, and there's going to be lack of kindness. But spiritually speaking, folks, it's so important. It is so crucially important that we spend our time with godly people and not with the people who are not following the Lord because evil communications corrupt. They drain out of us this kindness. Now let me close with this thought. Turn to Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. You got them all down? Jonah. I want you to read with me Jonah chapter 4 in the Thompson Chain Reference Bible, 4th edition. It's going to be page 851. Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. It displeased Jonah exceedingly that he was very, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, Oh, I pray thee, O Lord, was this not my saying when I was yet in my country? Okay. You know, you know the story of Jonah, three chapters worth. God said, Jonah, go. Jonah said, no. Down you go. And then he was in the belly of the whale, great fish. Then he was spit up, and then he goes back to Nineveh, and he preaches. Chapter 3, he preaches, and it's an amazing story. The king comes out, puts on sackcloth and ashes, and the king becomes the preacher. The king of Nineveh goes, everybody needs to repent of their sin and get right with God, because God's going to judge us. And the entire city repented. And you could have ended the, chap- the whole book there, right? Jonah 1, 2, and 3. Jonah didn't want to preach. God worked in his life. He went and preached, and the whole country got saved. End of the story, right? Why then does he give us chapter 4, which has nothing to do with Nineveh? What's chapter 4? He starts out and says, God, the whole city, isn't this exactly what I told you would happen? This is what I thought would happen? I'd go and preach and they'd get saved? And I didn't want them to get saved because they were the enemies. They are the people. They're, they're, the, they're the people that killed my family and my mom and my dad and all these other people. And they were the enemies. They would take the people of Israel after killing them. They would or chop off their heads to kill them, and they would pile up their skulls and shape the pyramids, one on each side of the gates. They hated Israel. They hated God's people. 
And God said, I have a heart for them. Go reach him. And Jonah said, uh, not me. And he ran. And God changed his plans, and he came back, and he preached. And So why is Jonah upset? Because he did not want God to spare that people. He wanted God to wipe them out. They deserved it. And this is chapter 4. Notice in verse 2 he says, Wasn't this not my saying when I was yet in my country? Verse 2 in the middle. Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art what kind of God? Here we go again. Gracious, merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness and repentance thee of evil. Have we seen that before? We've seen that before. See, it always goes in that order. That's the character of God. It's the kindness of God. And all of these attributes of God, His grace, His mercy, His long-suffering, and His forgiveness are always together, but they are not culminated and not in action until kindness comes in. Kindness is the catalyst to bring about God's forgiveness. Our evangelism begins when we are kind, self-sacrificial toward another. And that neighbor is bothering you, that friend, that person that's in your family, whatever it may be, that employer, and you think there's no way they'll ever get saved, and I'm praying for them, and that wicked heathen, they need to get saved. Did you realize that maybe God put you in their life to show kindness and self-sacrifice and die to yourself that that might be the very thing two months later or two years later for them to come to Christ. God doesn't want us just to be going around preaching with a blowhorn. He wants you to prepare the heart with kindness. That's, that's the ministry of God. Knowing God and knowing how He operates. Now, folks, let me tell you, sometimes you're kind and your kindness is rejected. For sake of time, I won't go there, but you can jot down in 2 Samuel chapter 10. David says, I want to show kindness to a family. Uh, the, the king of the neighboring country died, and I want to show kindness. And so he sent an, an embassy uh, of people to go and be kind unto the son. And they grabbed David's men, and they said, we don't like David. We don't like what he's doing. And they cut their robes in half to expose their buttocks. And then they went and shaved off their beards and total two very humiliating things. And he said, go back to David. And they came back to Jerusalem to David and they were, they were so ashamed and, and they were embarrassed and, and all of that. And David said, this is what I get for being kind. Let me tell you this. Be prepared, folks. In the same way that God has been kind and sending his son to die self-sacrificially to enable God's mercy and grace and forgiveness to take effect. And it's not received by some people. It's rejected and spurned. In the same way, your kindness will not always be accepted. And some people will reject it. So keep that in mind. You can share with someone, weep with someone, Pray for them and be kind and self-sacrificial and they still spit in your face. Don't give up. Did God give up on you? Don't give up. Sometimes, though, kindness is returned. And the kindness that, God, that David showed to Mephibosheth years later, if you look down through the story, we'll get there later, Mephibosheth comes back and shows kindness to David when David needed it the most. Has God been kind to you? He sure has. How are you being kind to Him? Are you returning and restoring that loyalty? Are you showing anything back? I think that if I knew a semi was going to flatten me and I was, on my, I was going to get wiped out, that I think from that moment forward, I'd be like, Lord, I'll give you my life. Is that what you're doing? We're so selfish of a people. Kindness is what God wants us to have. Let's surrender to Him. Let's pray. Fathers, we close today. Thank you for this time in Your Word. Thank you for the story that we have from David showing kindness. I pray that You would bless our dear folks. 
that they would be able to be strengthened in this spiritual character trait of gentleness and kindness, that they might be able to have an effective soul winning ministry to reach the lost, their family members, the co-workers, but even in their own marriages, may they save their marriage by being kind. The statistics show, and it's proven all around us, over 80% of people who are kind to their spouse have a lasting marriage, and the 20% who are unkind see it die. I pray that you would help us to live a life, day in and day out, of kindness, laying down our life, that others might be saved and life changed. For your honor and your glory, we thank you in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed.